All right, welcome to Computer Networks. This is lecture 24. A few quick announcements. We have homework 11 due this week. Uh, we get to chat for a few minutes at the beginning of this lecture. Homework 12, we're going to talk about that today. And uh, we're going to spend some time talking about the topics that are covered in exam two towards the end of this lecture. And if you're interested in signing up for student presentations, you need to do that very soon because we don't have a lot of classes left. OK, so there are some uh, topics that I suggested. They're posted on Piazza. And there are a few other topics I would like uh, to be covered. So if you're interested, please let me know as soon as possible. Could you close the door and also turn the lights off? Somewhere. Thank you. This is a summary of what we're supposed to do for homework 11. We're supposed to write a DNS server. It's a limited one. Uh, we don't implement all the functionalities. All we need to be able to do is return an IP address for, for a name sent by a client called dig. And in the process, we're going to learn how to read an RFC because that's the document that specifies the communication protocol between a DNS client and a server. And after reading the RFC, we should be able to implement it. So that's that's the goal of homework 11. Yeah. Uh, so I think uh, everything that I'm saying, everything that now I'm thinking, uh, when you test it with, let's say, because the specification says if you receive an invalid uh, uh, request, then you should return one error code. If you receive a request that you don't have information about, you should return another thing. So should we support that? Should we make sure that uh, if you query something that does not exist in our records, like the one, not one of those four things we uh, respond appropriately, and that if you give invalid query, then we respond appropriately? Yeah, so the question was, what if the client sends a name and we don't have that name in our database? What do we return? Uh, for that, we have not specified what you're supposed to do. You can just return a fake IP address or you can return an error code, uh, whatever you want. So the only thing that uh, you're supposed to be able to do is, if it is one of those names that we've listed on the web page, you have to return that IP address. That's the only thing that we've specified. This is just to uh, minimize the amount of work that you have to do. So because, we could just return nothing? Yeah, you could return just nothing. Cool. Any other questions? Anything you want to share about what you found most challenging, most annoying, time consuming, etc.? Yeah, go ahead. I ran into an extremely weird error that I don't think anyone else has had. I've like, talked to some other people that have already, I've already finished, but. Uh, yeah. I tried to implement it with a character array to begin with because I know the characters are basically you know, one octet or whatever, which is right. kind of the unit that we're dealing with. But whenever I would receive a character that had the most significant digit set to, set bit. to one, bit, yeah, bit, set to one, my, I don't know if it was my kernel, I was developing on the Ubuntu at home. I don't know if it was the kernel or if it was something else, but it would sign extend my, my, uh, my character, my octet, into a 32-bit negative integer, yeah. basically. And, and, so, I think yeah. and I think we're sort of seeing that on the demo that I, I did here as well. I think by default, and have, like, let's say, I'm not sure if that's what you encounter, like you have a character, plus when you do some operation, something that's a non, not a character with it. Like you test, you test for equality or something that's not a character. Wasn't doing any operation. Uh, like yeah. if you test for equality within uh, literal number, mm -hmm. it, it uh, uh, raises it to an integer. So it automatically converts it. Uh, that can yes. play between. So let me explain what the problem is that was just described here, which is every time you receive a byte with the most significant bit set to 1, we're having some problems because uh, you would uh, sign extend it to a 32-bit integer and so forth. Uh, what you might want to try is unsigned characters. Oh, oh well, I, what, I, what I ended up doing was instead of using a character array for my data structure, I used an unsigned integer, an 8-bit unsigned integer, basically, yeah. which, which is, solved all my problems. Right. <laughs> Except so you, then I couldn't use string copy anymore. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you can use unsigned character or unsigned um, integer array. Okay, fits. And any, anything else you would like to share? Anything weird? So I, what? I learned something interesting about structs too. I don't know if I want okay. to share, but uh, 
strokes are, uh, which I mean, I guess this is really common knowledge, but I didn't know it, but strokes are basically bite aligned to the, uh, so like if you have a stroke that only has, that has four things inside and they only add up to 10, 10 bites, and a lot of, if you do size up struct on it, it'll say 12 bites, because it's all, yeah. it does the. So another thing that we learned is struct, structures are bite aligned. And the, the size of the struct is going to depend on actually the machine on which you're running it. Anything else that we learned? So going back to structures, for example, if you don't serialize your structures properly and if you just write the structure, uh, you might get uh, very interesting results, especially if you have uh, boundaries at odd bytes. There's also a, there's a compilation command you can put on your GCC command line where you can compact all your yeah, structures. Yeah, packed structures. But then it doesn't, but then your, uh, if you use git uh, host, or git whatever the one beach uses, when he sets it up with hints and the uh, mm -hmm. server, if you use that, it, it doesn't work anymore. Because <laughs> yeah. your, address, your address size isn't right anymore. So that basically tells us that it's important to specify the network protocols precisely. If you just say, okay, here's a structure, and you send it over the network, then it'll be challenging to get it to work across a variety of machine architectures, right? Okay, so here's an idea behind homework 12. Uh, we're going to build on this DNS server that you've written, and we're going to run an HTTP proxy software to interact with this DNS server so that you can get access to HTTP using DNS. So let's look at this diagram. We have a browser, so this could be your Chrome or Firefox or whatever other browser you might use. That browser talks HTTP protocol, right? It does not talk DNS protocol. But if you write a little piece of software, I'm calling it proxy software here, that accepts HTTP communication on one side and trans translates that to DNS protocol on the other side, what you could do is do all this communication with a custom DNS server that is going to fetch the page that you're interested in fetching. And when the result comes back, you write it back as a DNS response, coming back to this proxy. And the proxy can serve that page using HTTP to your client. Why might you want to do this? Well, one, we want to learn how to run one protocol on top of another, uh, because that's how all the uh, network protocols are designed, right? We write one protocol on top of another. So that's the educational purpose of uh, this assignment. And we can talk, talk more about this at the end of this uh, lecture today. Uh, but that's... Just call Git. Say that again? And instead of uh, creating a query, can we just uh, parse the uh, domain name and call Git at custom DNS server? Yeah, you could do that. Okay. You could also use so DIG. So we're, you're going to get more details of this assignment uh, probably in a day or two. All right? So that's the idea. So it's important that uh, you do homework 11 if you want to do homework 12 because it builds on top of it. And even if you give you custom, or even if you give you skeleton code for a custom DNS server, it's important that you understand how it works, uh, which you are doing in homework 11. All right, so today uh, we're going to talk about some uh, policies that govern the Internet. And we're going to spend a few minutes at the end of the lecture uh, just, uh, doing a brief overview of the topics uh, that I think you should focus on when you're studying in the next few days. All right, so here, here's a list of topics we're going to cover today, basically Internet and the policies governing the Internet. And this is going to be mostly... Uh, done in a discussion format, I'll present a uh, few pieces of information, and we're going to discuss uh, these uh, topics. Okay, first, here's a graph that I grabbed from what is called Google Transparency Report 2011. As it indicates uh, near the top, that uh, this shows traffic across all Google products, I believe going in and out of Egypt. Do you notice that there is a drop-off just before the 28th? Yeah. And then it uh, picks up again on the, tw on the 2nd, I think, of February. 
what do you think was going on during that time? Arab Spring. Yeah, so the Egyptian government decided that its citizens should not have internet access. That's the that's the stated policy of the government at that time, right? I don't know if uh, that blocked uh, traffic to everywhere, but at least to Google products, it seems like, like there was a, a steep drop off. Here is something closer to home. And this shows traffic to the site megaupload.com and megavideo.com. I actually hadn't heard about these sites until um, the news broke out that FBI had raided their uh, physical US office um, in the US. And what do we notice happened to their traffic? The dates aren't important, as some kind of uh, drop off that we see. Right? So the point of all this is it turns out it's possible to control traffic to websites. Right? We can do that. So the question is, who should determine what networks should be accessible? And we can be a little bit more specific and say with websites. Because a website could be a collection of server. And the way to bring that down is either by shutting down the servers or doing something bad to the servers or to do something to the network connectivity to the servers, right? So I want to hear your thoughts on, uh, first of all, why we might want some control over you know, which websites should be accessible. Not just thinking about US perspective, but also the global perspective. And what are some of the challenges there? So that's the first topic for discussion. We want to keep it relatively short, so uh, I want you to offer your suggestions uh, quickly, OK? Because we have a lot of topics that we want to cover. Important, like a big brother that takes care of you. So one argument is uh, it's nice to have a big brother uh, who's going to take care of you, who's going to uh, keep you from um, accessing bad websites. OK, any, any other thoughts? Yeah, go ahead. It's really, it's really like a political question. I mean, uh, and it's, it's, it's like loaded, you know? Because, you know, it, some people would say, well, you know, all this information should be free no matter what. But then other people should say, well, there's things that we agree as a society, and you know, we have like a social contract or whatever, which you can call it government, that, where there's certain things that you shouldn't do because they're bad. Mm -hmm. And as a corollary to that, maybe there's certain things that you shouldn't show because we don't want, because they're bad, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, I think it just depends on your your point of view, like where you draw the line, like what's bad and what's good. Like, you know, obviously if there's something that's bad in Saudi Arabia, you know, like, you know, you know maybe, you know, I don't know, drinking, or, you know, showing somebody who's consuming alcohol right, and something that's bad here, I mean, two completely different things. Right. So uh, I guess the suggestion there was, as a society, we consider something bad and something good. And it might not be a bad idea to draw a line somewhere, depending on our viewpoints. And there needs to be a way to control the bad information from getting to people. So that is one suggestion. Yeah, go ahead. You get into the problem, though, if you start trusting any sort of bureaucracy to decide what's good and bad, it's really easy to cross over that line. Oh, I don't agree with what these people are saying, so I'm going to silence them because they differ in opinion. So there's definitely a danger in, in trying to determine what's good and bad for an entire set of people and then have some entity try to control that. Right. So, uh, so that's a nice segue into the discussion of challenges of uh, doing access control. Uh, we will inevitably give power to a certain group of people to determine, okay, what is good, what is bad, and what prevents them from um, going above and beyond what they're supposed to do just because they're not happy with some opinions expressed about them or some topic that they care about. Uh, and they might start imposing arbitrary control over information, right? So uh, more relevant uh, to this class, and uh, now that we understand some of, the, um, some, some of the ideas that make this issue important as well as challenging, at least uh, socially, Let's think of it from a technical perspective. How would you design a system to enforce these policies? We actually talked a little bit about it during um, our discussion of BGP. There are many ways. If you want to you know, 
cut access to the internet, there are many ways uh, you might uh, be able to accomplish that. Uh, can you offer some suggestions? But we are the, uh, the ISP, you know, the very government, very good engineering work, so. Right. Yeah, so it turns out uh, to enforce uh, such access is pretty easy, right? You just uh, go to the ISP and say, um, okay, let's not have our customers or our citizens be able to access this information um, anymore. And the suggestion here was ISPs are controlled by the government anyway, various government regulations, so the government can do that. But uh, is that as straightforward as... Uh, it sounds. Is it uh, easy to circumvent uh, some of this access control? You block the server, then if they block a specific IP, then you can go to that proxy and the IP. Okay, so um, let's say if we're trying to control access to information by IP address, one suggestion was if we use proxy server, then the service provider is going to think that the request is coming from this other IP address that is not restricted. So that is how you're able to circumvent that. Uh, any other ideas on uh, how you might uh, circumvent some of these uh, access control? Well, if someone does it with DNS, then you can still access an IP address directly without having to do a name lookup. So if you know the address to Google, you can still get to Google without doing a DNS query. Yeah. So let's say the access control is imposed by disabling DNS or making DNS service unavailable. And if you, if you know the IP address, you could access the IP address. Uh, you could access the service directly using the IP address. So that would be one idea. But Any other ideas? You could just, yeah, you know what I'm saying? You could just change your DNS server in your file or host file to mm -hmm. whatever file it is. It's 8888, which is Google DNS. Mm -hmm. That's available everywhere. It pretty much has everything. Unless they shut down the top level of DNS things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, um, this suggestion related to the earlier one, which is even if certain DNS service, uh, even if certain DNS servers are made unavailable, you could always use alternate DNS servers, perhaps uh, the one run by Google or some other organizations, right? But one thing to keep in mind, though, is evidence suggests that it's not as easy as we think it is to circumvent some of this access control. Uh, for example, uh, Google did not get pretty much any traffic during those times when the government decided that uh, the, its citizens should not have access to the internet. So there are different types of control, of course, uh, that we're talking about, but we should also keep in mind that uh, it's not that easy to... Perhaps it depends on the technical knowledge of the person trying to access Right. So it depends on the technical knowledge of the users, exactly. Yeah. Now, uh, just uh, one other quick note about uh, control to uh, certain types of information. Uh, let's say a country decides that uh, you should not have access to uh, a particular website or, say, YouTube. That's, this has happened, you know, for some countries in recent past. How would you circumvent? Because based on the knowledge, you know, from this class and this general knowledge, you, sh you should be able to propose some techniques on how you might circumvent that. Some websites uh, that I know about, uh, they, they mask themselves as another site. They just change their IP address and their domain name. Mm -hmm. So they, they keep some phones at the same time. They just every time they get shut down, they just start up with another domain. Yeah. So one one suggestion is if uh, if you are being blocked from accessing a particular website. Uh, maybe that service provider is going to launch that service using a different identity in domain name or IP address, right? So this is a different type of uh, control um, that we are talking that we talked about earlier, right? Which is uh, earlier we talked about service providers not wanting certain users to be able to access information, but now we're talking about certain users not being able to access uh, certain services. Have you heard of something called deep? packet inspection. So the idea is you not only look at the destination IP address, you not only look at, for example, uh, that you're sending a request to youtube.com, but you actually look inside the packet to understand what you're requesting and what you're getting back. 
platform. So those techniques are going to make it uh, increasingly challenging to circumvent some of these controls using straightforward techniques. So the question was, is deep packet inspection legal? Uh, you probably have to go ask uh, someone in the law school. I do not know the answer. If you're the government of China? Yeah. Question. If you're the government, the government of the United America. States, maybe it's legal in cer in under, circum uh, under certain circumstances. It's an inspect the data segment of the back, right? Payload. Yes. Uh, and what if you encrypt it? Yeah, what if you, well, the question is, is encryption legal? And it turns out that's a legitimate question. In depending on the context. All right, so hopefully, so we're going to stop this discussion right now because we have other topics to cover, but hopefully this gives us a flavor for the challenges in this area if you want to impose access control as well as circumvent. And if, if we want to have a sound perspective on um, this issue, we need to understand both the sides, the technical challenges as well as societal challenges. All right? Let's spend a few moments talking about domain names. The question here is, who should determine what names are allowed and what names should be allocated to which organizations? Uh, do you know how it works roughly now? Who decides what names are allocated to which organizations right now? For example, am I allowed to have www.microsoft.com? Let's say you know, I, want to, I want a website and I really like that name. Well, that's already registered. There's like registrars that are out there that keep yeah. track of what's already been. Yeah, so there are registrars that keep track of what names have been allocated to what organizations. But uh, let's say I came up with a company name, and it turns out somebody else has already registered that name. Uh, should I be able to take over that domain name? Well, there's actually a case history of that. Micro had Microsoft.com right. and Microsoft him to court, or I think they, they eventually settled out of court for it, right? but they attempted to have a legal case that he was using something that could be mistaken for their uh, intellectual property. Right. So the... And they would have won that one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which is why he settled. Yeah. yeah. So um, one example that was cited here was there, 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 there's a person with the name Micro. I think that's his name, Mike Rowe. <laughs> and he had a domain name that sounded and looked very similar to Microsoft.com. And uh, there was a lawsuit, and they eventually had to settle. So what does that tell us about these names that just exist on the internet? It turns out the, the, these names have a value, and turns out these names don't just exist in the internet. That's the key idea, right? These aren't just names in the internet. Yeah, but Yeah, so the suggestion here was uh, when you get a domain name, it should legally be your property. Do you want to use that word or property, yes. private property? So I don't know where the law stands there. Um, again, we need to go ask some law school people. But uh, it's definitely the case that if you try to use a name that somebody claims and proves that uh, it sounds very similar to an already existing name that is being used for commerce, uh, then you might not be able to actually be in control of that name. Especially okay. if it's a registered trademark. Yeah, especially if it is a registered trademark, that's right. So let's think about top-level domain names. Uh, we've been uh, hearing a little bit of news about you know, what kind of top-level domain names are uh, top-level domains are allowed, what kind of top-level domains are not allowed. Do we know what top-level domains are? The thing at the end of your... <laughs> the, the, thing, the thing at the end, right? Dot .com, dot .org, dot .net. What other top-level domains do you know of? Didn't they just recently... Can't you have anything now? Isn't that, the, isn't that what just happened? You see, that's not true. You can't have anything. Okay. It's, so there's dot .com, dot .net, dot .org, dot dot .edu, dot .mil, dot .gov. And also the countries, right? Yeah. Dot yeah. Dot yeah. And there is dot .info, biz, et cetera, right? It turns out there is an organization that determines what top-level domains are allowed. Is that a good thing? For example, if, if you want 
a top level domain that you really like, shouldn't you be able to just have that? Why should this organization so decide? Have, you know, mm -hmm. Because the names become an issue after a while. You know, like when somebody types something in, they get, they get this long and you can't remember it. Yeah. So here's my argument to you, but no one is forcing you to go to that service. If you don't like the name, I didn't say force. I said it's a good thing. I didn't say it's a good thing. <laughs> so, so okay. So the suggestion here was it's uh, good to have some standard about what the names are supposed to look like. How is that argument different from let's say someone, let's say the government saying, well, if you want to have a name, it has to sound like this. It has to have this many characters. Um, does that sound similar? It's a name, right? Yeah. Let's say the government refused to register your business if your name sounded, you know, in, like, you know, let's say something that they, someone sitting there at the desk doesn't like. Would that thing. be acceptable to you? It's not a good thing to have things censored arbitrarily. Yeah. So it's not a good thing to have you know, at least your name censored arbitrarily, but is there a non-arbitrary censorship that uh, we can live with? That's the, that's the question. And maybe this organization serves that purpose. As long as the views represented in the organization truly reflects, you know, what uh, everyone wants. But do you think this organization reflects the views of everyone in the world? Because this internet is supposed to be a worldwide network. Oh, really? Probably not, yeah. Okay. Another problem too with what each one means, because you can you can register a .com whether or not you're in the U.S. You can register a .eu whether or not you're in Europe, and you know .com is supposed to be for commercial and org is supposed to be for organizations, but that's not the case. Yeah. Ever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So now, from a technical perspective. Uh, when we're talking about domain names, uh, we can go back to our assignment and think about uh, DNS servers, right? Uh, eventually, the reason we're interested in names is because names allow people to remember how to access the network services, uh, most often websites, right? And it turns out there has been some movement, I don't know how successful, to have alternate DNS routes. Uh, these root servers keep track of servers that are allowed to respond to queries related to the top level domains. Right. I recently read about, uh, for example, some countries, they, they wanted to have their own uh, top level domains. Uh, they, they don't use English characters, so they wanted uh, their characters to also be able to uh, resolve into IP addresses. Of course, this organization would not allow that, uh, but this uh, country has enough might that they can actually ask all the ISPs to say, okay, so we're going to allow this particular uh, TLDs in our native character, and this was actually implemented. I don't know how successful it has been, and I don't know what uh, the current status is, but that's certainly possible. So how would you implement an alternate DNS route from technical perspective? Let's think about how we configure DNS servers and how name resolution works. So let's say we send a request to a DNS server saying, I want, to, I want an IP address for www.mydomain.com. And let's say this is a small DNS server in our department. And that DNS server does not know the IP address. It does not have the IP address in its table. What does that DNS server do? Yeah, it might go to the root servers if it is a TLD that it, it has never heard of and ask the root server, okay, what server should I go to to resolve this address, right? So if you wanted to implement an alternate DNS route, how would you do that? You would write your own DNS server software and change the hard-coded root servers? Yeah. Use your own root servers? Yeah. So I would go a step uh, further and say so you don't even need to write your own DNS software. Because DNS servers, there's many open source implementations out there. You just need to tweak the configuration uh, to determine, you know, where you go if you hear of this particular TLD, right? Does that make sense? Okay. What's the problem with having these alternate DNS routes? 
some people are using one set of roots and other people are using the other set of roots. Uh -huh. You're never going to have any sort of consistent pathways through the internet. Yeah, Mike, double up on so I would be a little bit more precise and say by pathways, did you, did you mean consistency in names that we use yeah. in the internet? Okay, yeah. so the suggestion here was if we have alternate, if everyone, if every country is using its own root servers, we might not have globally unique names. We might not have consistent names. Uh, for example, mydomain.com might mean one thing in one country and maybe something completely different in another country. That's a potential issue here. We want to have alternate DNS routes. But the only reason the alternate DNS, this idea of alternate DNS routes even come up is because there are these organizations that control the more global, I would just say more global root servers that are not going to accommodate all the requests coming from these countries. That's the only reason why we talk about alternate DNS routes, right? But there's always going to be parties uh, that are going to make a request uh, that the bigger group is going to reject, right? OK. All right. Next, uh, let's talk about IP addresses. So here's the question. Um, once you have an IP address, is that your property? That's the question. Uh, but before we get to that discussion, let's review very briefly how IP address allocation works. So there's a set of you know, IP addresses. There is a global organization that maintains a list of all the IP addresses that have been allocated and not allocated. So there's a global organization that allocates IP addresses to the regional uh, organizations. Uh, let's say there is one organization that's re responsible for allocating IP addresses to, let's say, American companies, North American companies. So the global organization gives IP addresses to this regional organization, and this regional organization is going to allocate IP addresses to various companies and organizations as they need those IP addresses. So now let's say there's, there's a company that got you know, a certain number of IP addresses from this regional organization. Now is that IP address a property of that organization? What do you think? Yeah, go ahead. To me, it seems very analogous to like a landlord-tenant relationship, mm -hmm. whereas like whenever you lease a house, mm -hmm. you don't own that house. It's not your property, but you definitely have certain rights. <clears throat> yeah. Like your landlord can't just come in whenever he wants to. He can't take it away from you without following strict rules and procedures and things like that. So I don't think it's their property, but I definitely think they have some some, some right to it, to, to work with it, to use it, to not have it taken away without notice. Basically. Okay, so the suggestion here was maybe the relation between the company that actually got the allocation and the organization that provided the allocation, maybe it's analogous to landlord-tenant relationship, uh, which is, you know, you definitely have some rights to that IP address, uh, but maybe not, uh, you know, absolute rights to those uh, IP addresses. Uh, do we have any thoughts on what some of those rights might be and what uh, the organization might uh, might not be allowed to do with those IP addresses. What, like an organization can't sell the IP address? Like you, you basically give them IP addresses and like, oh, I'm going to sell it to someone else. And that's one of the rights. Okay, so one of the rights that you don't have is to sell the IP addresses. So that was one of the suggestions. Any, any other suggestion? I'm going to elaborate on that in a minute. Any other suggestion as to what rights you might have and what rights you might not have? You may have the right to, sub, to essentially sublet some of your IP addresses. Okay, so you're not allowed to sell it, but you're allowed to maybe sublet or sublist the IP addresses. Any other suggestions? I guess within reason, they don't have a right to like censor what you do with your IP address. Like just because they don't like what you're doing doesn't mean doesn't break that contract that they lease the IP address to you. Yeah, necessarily. So maybe the suggestion here is maybe there is some expectation as to what is uh, what is an acceptable behavior, or what is an acceptable use of those IP addresses. So it turns out in order for you to get an IP address allocation, you need to actually demonstrate that you need these IP addresses. You can't just go to this organization and say, okay, give me ten thousand IP addresses. You need to actually demonstrate you have a legitimate need for these IP addresses. Yes, we're talking about globally unique IP addresses. When I use static IP globally unique for my ISP, and I, I just did some things for work, just call the ISP and get Yeah. But what if you want uh, oh, thousands? That's not the organization. Your ISP is yeah, yeah, yeah. but it was, a, it was a unique 
food in the entire world, actually. Yeah, but but yeah. you're but talking you're, about you're subletting. Yeah, you're subletting from your ISP. <laughs> yeah, the ISP has has friction. Yes. But for example, do you think, uh, do you believe you'll be able to just go to your ISP and say, give me 100 IP addresses and they will just give it to you? I don't know, like 100, yeah. 20, yeah, sure. If, if, how much you pay them? Yeah, even 20, it, not, it might not be as straightforward as you think. Because 20, we got 20. You got 20, okay. Was it in the US? For the, for the, yeah, for the co-op. Okay, for the co-op, okay. I believe that the ISP already knows what this organization is about, yeah, and there's so probably been that contracts that have been signed in the past that allowed you yeah. to get 20 IP addresses. Um, I heard that uh, there is one ISP, I don't know which one, they actually will not give you a static, you know, globally unique IP address if you don't prove, or if you're not able to prove that you're an organization. For example, as an individual, they're just not going to give you a static IP address. Okay. So um, going back to the right to, for example, sell IP addresses, uh, I won't give you all the details of this particular case, but there was a, uh, there was a case um, about Microsoft and Nortel. I think this was last year or maybe the year before. Microsoft actually either acquired part of Nortel or entire Nortel because it turns out Nortel actually had a huge number of IP addresses allocated to it. And there were a lot of questions about, you know, was this a sale of IP addresses, or was it a sale of the company, or part of the company? And depending on your view, you might actually come up with a different answer. It's true, IP addresses cannot be, for example, you can't go to eBay and say, here are the IP addresses I have, and, you know, here's, the, uh, here's uh, how much I'm selling it for. You can't do that. But what if you sell your company to a different company? Should you be... So do you allow to retain the use of uh, your IP addresses? Yeah, go ahead. I think it depends on whether or not that company that you're purchasing is going to continue the operation of their regular business underneath the umbrella of the corporate structure or whatever. Mm -hmm. If you're just buying them to dissolve them and take their IP addresses, I think that's one situation. Mm -hmm. But if you're buying them so that they continue their business mm -hmm. and maybe share their IP addresses with you, I don't know, <laughs> then uh, I think that's a, that's a gray area. So the suggestion here was if you're buying a company, to get the IP addresses and just dissolve that company or whatever the company was doing, then uh, that does not sound reasonable. But what if uh, you know that branch is doing really poorly in business and you have to shut it down a month after you acquire that company? And you didn't do your due diligence properly whenever you were purchasing the corporation to begin with. And in that case, that's something that needs to be taken into consideration by whoever's deciding whether or not this purchase would. I mean, it's an intent thing. It's like a, it's like any intent crime, basically. You know, like you know, did did you kill this person? On, you know, on purpose, basically. I feel like the, well, you have to you get inside your due, due diligence, and they have other assets that make it worthwhile regardless. Yeah, well, I mean, like, they're, they're, then that's your that's your thing, man. I mean, that's a, it's it's all it's like a, if it's, you're buying them anyway, uh, just just to sell well, off you're, all you're their assets. You're proving my point. You're proving my point. It's just it's a, it's a complex IP address. Okay, it's a complex weight issue, right? It's a complex like you know, it's not just like the, it's it's not black or white. I mean, it's it's a it's probably like a, a ten part balancing test. They can talk about those in a law a lot. So I, I want to cut off this discussion, but I just want to ask you <laughs> just one question worth thinking about. Uh, for example, why do we even ask this question, you know, okay, are we allowed to sell IP addresses? Why do we even ask that question? Or why is, it, why is that question even because worth they, asking? Because the organizations have control of IP addresses anyway. Yeah. Because once you start selling them, yeah. So we don't want that business model. That's exactly the point. We don't want one company to hoard all the IP addresses and create scarcity and make a lot of money just selling IP addresses. We decided that we don't want that business model in the internet. Like kind of like radio waves in the sense that there's a limited amount. There's yeah, we're going to talk about that. A too. concrete amount right. that you have. Right. We're going to talk about actually spectrum in a few slides from now. All right. Now, um, this is also a pretty recent thing, maybe starting about 2010. Uh, there, there has been uh, many legislations introduced uh, discussing this possibility. Should government take, be able to take over critical network systems when under threat? Okay, what is, uh, let me just elaborate a little bit first. Uh, first of all, we need to define what we mean by critical network systems. And uh, some of these legislations say, well, uh, we're going to have this particular department, this particular agency determine what is critical. 
And what is critical is going to span over private infrastructure and private property as well, right? And it's not clear what takeover actually means. Uh, it could be just uh, maybe being able to read your email, emails or being able to do some uh, intrusive work to legitimately fight up all the bad things that are happening to these systems, right? We should also consider that possibility, of course, because not all the companies possibly have all the information and the resources to fight off uh, some of the bad things that are happening to them. That's kind of the idea. So yeah, what are your thoughts? You know, should government be able to take over critical network systems under a threat? What's, what's threat? Uh, well, uh, that's also to be defined. That is also to be defined. Well, in this country, they, they have the right to seize our like, property, like our house, in a time of war. So mm -hmm. I guess anything goes. <laughs> they do? Yeah, they have the right. Eminent domain? Like, where does that, how is that constitutional? No, we're not talking about eminent domain. That's a non-war. No, no, no. He's not talking about eminent domain. You're talking about basically what rights does the government have over private property at times of war or when there is an emergency? Uh, I'm gonna have to stand fast. The government cannot take your house in time of war. Sorry, you can't. You can't that's totally. That's totally against the constitution. I mean, you can't have. You can't be forced to quarter soldiers in your house. I mean, like. It, it's, <laughs> I, I, I went to law school, man. I, I took constitutional law. I know you can't, you can't do that. <laughs> no, in a time of war, they can literally seize your property and use it. Not your house, though. I don't yes, know. Your house. But I think we agree I think that they can, they can use, oh, yeah, they can they use it, but they're yeah, not, they're they're not they're permanently they're acquiring it. Right. I know, but they're seizing it. That's what I mean. Like they're yeah. but, the same. They don't have but, to ask you before so, they use so, but, your property. But I think we agree. I think we agree that government has extraordinary control over many things uh, that uh, they don't have control over during ordinary times, but at times of war or times of emergency, however that is defined, they have extraordinary control over various things that we might be surprised about. And there, there's a legislation that uh, was introduced by an independent and a Republican and a Democrat uh, talking about uh, this uh, power that the government should have and um, let's not forget uh, the motivation here. The motivation here is the network and the internet has become a very critical part of our lives, right? So if there's a critical part of the internet that is under a threat of some kind. Then and so, why, is, so then why does the government need to step in? Uh, because it's going to cause... It's designed to be distributed. So if yeah. some part of it goes down, yeah. we just work around that. Yeah. Government and government. the other part is <laughs> the companies that have it now their entire profit margin is based on keeping that working. Yeah. Why, how are they any less motivated than the government to solve this problem if a problem arises? Right. So um, the, the question here was, why, why is government uh, even better positioned to fend off some of these threats? Because the companies have the motivation to keep their network secure and keep it running, even under emergencies. Not to mention, a lot of people that are in charge don't even know about the technology necessary to do this. I mean, with the SOPA and the people that the people that were doing this legislation didn't even understand how the network works. So why should we want the government to take over to protect us from some threat that they're not even capable of understanding? The suggestion here was uh, people who are working on legislation, uh, for example, they don't understand the technology deeply enough to be legislating these, these laws. And uh, there's also a question as to, uh, is the government competent enough, technically, to be able to do these things? I offer a counter-argument to that. We've all heard of NSA, for example. My guess is they are sort of competent uh, to do these things. So there are various you know, parts of the government, right? So we can't completely dismiss the government saying, oh, the government is incompetent. But can they be as competent as the company that has people whose sole job and has been their job for years is to yeah. manage this specific infrastructure. So is, the, the is question... Is there any advantage in bringing in other people who maybe are as technically competent yeah. but haven't or don't have that same familiarity with the system? Yeah. So the question here was, uh, do we believe that the gov government will ever be more technically competent and technically able to protect us from these threats? That's the question. And I think uh, the answer is not known. Uh, but something to think about uh, as we support or oppose this legislation.
Now let's spend a few minutes talking about our expectation to privacy. Uh, we expect, uh, uh, for example, what we do in our homes to be private. We expect most of our communication to be private, right? For example, you're not allowed to open somebody else's letter. Right? Not supposed to do that, not allowed to do that. So the question is, can we expect our communication over the internet to remain private? What are your expectations? Technically speaking or ethically speaking? <laughs> Legally speaking. <laughs> Legally, I don't think that you know law enforcement should arbitrarily wiretap things and snoop through your email and things just because they want to. Uh -huh. I mean, if you can make a justification the same way that they do when they get a warrant to come in and search your house or whatever, that's one thing. Mm -hmm. But so, so ethically and legally, I think no. But technically, mm, probably it's going to happen. Hey, it's, not just something, it's not just the government you got to worry about. It's, I mean, like, it, you know, who owns these routers where you're sitting? Right. Yeah, yeah, I mean, like, it's, I, I mean, I, I, whenever I use the internet, I have no, I have every expectation that everything I'm doing is being watched by someone else. Is, is, is that a desirable situation I, for you? It doesn't affect me is, at all. Okay. I, I mean, like, it's... Is it it's, it's not negative or positive. It's just how it is. So the question is: Is it desirable or unavoidable? I don't do anything. I don't do anything wrong. You know, like if you're afraid of being watched, stop doing yeah, stuff. It's, 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 it's wrong. wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, they have the Patriot Act. They, I mean, you can get hacked. It's like it should be expected. Like, it's like a open forum where. So know, should we have? It's like mm -hmm. because it's the problem is if you compare email to say you know snail mail. Then you're thinking of you know some post office worker, you know opening up your envelope to see what you wrote, mm -hmm. but that's not what's happening here because you're not sending it by the equivalent of government mail. You're mm -hmm. writing a postcard, mm -hmm. so there's no envelope concealing it, and you're not sending it by government mail. You're handing it to the, your neighbor and saying, hey, can you pass this towards such and such destination? Yeah. And he passes it to someone else, and they pass it to someone else, and they pass it to someone else, and so on. And it's, it's not realistic to assume that nobody's going to look at it as they pass it along. I see. So I don't know where the law stands, but uh, I'm not sure if uh, FedEx or UPS, uh, they're allowed to read your letters. Are they allowed to read your letters? I don't know. I would assume not. Because that's not government. That's not government, right? Oh, you mean FedEx the United States without the government being involved? Yeah. I don't think well, probably their contract says that they Yeah, do. it's probably in the contract. There's, with there's a there. business advantage for them to guarantee that that won't happen. Yeah. If they wrote in their, if they wrote in their, you know, in your user agreement with them, we reserve the right to look at anything that comes through here, and sure they can do it. But they probably don't do that because it's probably not a good business model. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, it's probably not a package that has national security, like, you know, with a bomb or something in it. I think they... Well, but they don't. They don't. But they, they don't have, do anything about it. They, they have reason to believe the federal that government. That, that, that they, they, they contact something. the federal government, and the federal government has the rights to open it up if they believe it's a threat. That's not the same as them, as, as FedEx or UPS. So. Yeah, but I think I would argue that not only do they have the ability, but they have the responsibility to determine whether or not things that they are shipping through their network are threats. Yeah. And so I think that they not only can they look at your stuff, but they have a responsibility to look at it to make sure it's okay. No, they don't have a they have a responsibility to examine what's what's available without opening your package. Yeah, that's if, what I'm saying. With, without I'm opening, saying. yeah, ex actually opening your package and examining the contents is the government's job. Uh, nothing in nothing in the contract gives right. them the right. So let's get back to computer networks. So can, <laughs> can, your, can your ISP turn over emails to the government? Sure, if they get a subpoena. So it turns out there has been a case related to this, where there was a lawsuit between a government entity and a private company, and the private company was involved in some, uh, many people thought, uh, you know, unethical practices, and the government was looking for some evidence, because uh, you can't just say, okay, we suspect that you're do doing something bad, you need evidence, right? And it turns out the government used a law cited the law when they went to the ISP, and the ISP started logging the emails for a year and handed over all the emails to the government. Later, uh, the court ruled that that law is unconstitutional. But the government actually used that law before it was declared unconstitutional to log all the emails. So why might it be unconstitutional for your ISP to log your emails? Well, 
No, it's the government that went to the ISP and say, okay, here's the law, so you start logging the emails. In that particular case, were they logging everybody's email or just a specific person? A specific person's email. Doesn't it also matter based on what your contract is with that person? Because if you make a contract with the ISP that stipulates that at any time they can inspect your traffic or whatever, then where's the legal yeah. unconstitutionality of that? You made a contract with a private company that said, this is part of the service that we offer. Right. There are these stipulations there. But actually, the government doesn't have the ability to interfere with contracts. So if it wasn't a contract that they're not allowed to do that, right. then that's it. But you can't put just anything you want in the contract, right? Some people would argue the other way. Some people would argue with you. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, you can't give away certain rights. That's, that's true. I mean, it depend in this country, yeah. yeah. That's true. You can't sign an unconscionable contract. Too. Like, right. It has to be consideration, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So we're not only talking about the government, for example, can they inspect your emails, but also, uh, you know, there are other types of relationships. For example, company and employee, employer and employee relationships. For example, uh, should, we, should we expect that your boss reads all of your emails or has the ability to read all your emails if you send emails using your corporate network? Absolutely. Yeah, okay, absolutely. It, it depends on what your stipulation in employment is. If they say that they're not going to, then yeah. fine. But if you Why would they say that? Well, they wouldn't, but I'm saying if they say that they're not going to do it, then you have expectation of privacy. If they yes. say, or they don't say anything about yeah. it, you're using their network, yeah. then why wouldn't they? Yeah. Most likely, most employers probably, they, have, they, they probably retain the ability uh, to inspect your emails, right? Okay. How about company and consumers? For example, you go to Google and search for various things. What kind of expectation of privacy do you have? For example, is it okay for Google to uh, you know, put a press release saying, uh, Mr. Swenso actually searched for these kind of things? Is that okay? Because that, that's, a, that's a company and if consumer relationship. The privacy relation. agreement says that they're okay to do that. They do it, but not in the way you say it, like the press release. <laughs> I think there's no expectation that you're going to have privacy of what you search for because Google's making money by selling your browsing history and whatever to ad companies so that they can make money. Right. And I'm sure, I haven't read the mm -hmm. however many page long agreement, but I'm sure it's somewhere in there that says they reserve the right to use your browsing history yeah. for their purposes. Yeah. And here's something uh, worth uh, thinking about as to how the current ad delivery networks work, at least on the web. I don't know if you've noticed this or not. If you go to a shopping site and search for a few things, this information goes to the ad network, actually. And even if you go visit a different website, completely different website, let's say next you go to CNN.com, and if they're serving ads from the same ad network, you're going to see advertisements for things that are very similar to what you were searching earlier. That's how so Facebook ad works. Man, Facebook is the worst about that. Like, Facebook's so bad, like, I got, I got a... Uh, I got an ad one time to like participate in a gout study, and I was like, "Oh my God, do I have gout? Like Facebook thinks I have gout. I must have something wrong with me." You know? <laughs> now, in terms of technology, how can we protect our information from being public? Uh, we can use encryption, right, to some extent. If you can legally acquire that software. Yeah, if, if you're legal, you're not allowed to say that again. What about Gmail? Uh, Gmail or MS, uh, Hotmail, do they encrypt your email? Uh, well, I'm sure they provide encrypted email options. Uh, some service providers are now use encrypted options by default and some. Congratulations, you picked your stupid question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So now, how about on the other side? If you want to actually extract some of this information so that type of software is usually called spyware. Basically it's a piece of software that might be snooping various activities that are being performed you know, on your machines. Right? We've all, of, all heard of this word, right? Spyware. It's basically bad software that gets downloaded automatically, installed automatically, and it's going to collect all this information from you, invading your privacy. 
Here's another topic, net neutrality. You've probably heard of this. Uh, this, was a pretty, this was a pretty hot topic a couple of years ago. Um, so the basic question is, are ISPs required to be neutral to different services? That's the question. So ISPs are companies like AT&T, Comcast, et cetera, that sell internet service to the consumers, at least in the retail market. But there are also bigger ISPs, as we learned uh, during student presentation, that provide services to bigger corporations, right? OK. So that's the question. Are ISPs required to be neutral to different services? Not yet. OK. So the answer was not yet. So that means it's not the law yet. Didn't the Netflix CEO just recently come out? OK. I'll, I'll show that to you in a little bit. Yeah, okay. But uh, this discussion really started you know, a couple of years ago with uh, the Comcast case. Uh, it turns out Comcast was throttling peer-to-peer -peer traffic. Under various pretexts, we don't need to go to the details, but Comcast was saying, OK, we're going to rate limit the peer-to-peer -peer traffic. And there was a lot of discussion as to whether an ISP is allowed to say, we're going to slow down this particular type of traffic. Do you think ISPs should be allowed to say that? We're going to slow down this type of traffic, and we're going to speed up this other type of traffic? Go ahead. I think this uh, hits on like a bigger issue that people in this country have, is that they don't understand the difference between a right and a privilege. You, know? mm -hmm. like you don't have the right to internet access. Okay, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. It's just it's not, that's not, a, no, actually, that's not a right. Actually, uh, uh, according to the United Nations Charter, well, this is the United Nations. Access. <laughs> uh, you have the right to buy human access. Yeah, yeah I mean, you have, yeah, I mean, you, have the, you have the privilege of access to the internet. So like, mm -hmm. you know, at some, you know, obviously, I want, I love the idea of neutrality. I think it's okay. great. Right. But at the same time, I also love the idea of capitalism. And if these people are the ones that are surprised, uh, supplying this stuff, how don't you have the right to the internet when it's a global thing? Like each person contributes. You have the right to buy. Internet no, no, that's not what I mean. I mean, if you think of it in the general sense, like every person, like we are the internet. Like my post machine, the his post machine, we can, we are the internet. So, so you're saying if none of the if no ISP wants to sell you access, no, I mean, then we have no. Then you're if still we don't there. use it, then there is no internet. So I mean, technically, we do have the right to buy. If, if you don't buy a car, we right? are if no the internet. Yeah, but if no one buys cars, then no one's going to sell cars. Yeah, you know? like yeah. all it's just economics, man. I know what you're saying. Yeah. So, anyways, the suggestion here was maybe we don't have a legal right to a neutral internet, and that's true on, unless we have law that says you know you have the right to a neutral internet. So I guess you're technically correct when you said that. But the discussion really should be, you know, should the internet be neutral? And if it should be, maybe we should enact some laws. And if it shouldn't, then maybe we should forget about it. Right. So you had a I was gonna say in this case of like net neutrality net neutrality and being able to throttle things based on it, isn't there a problem when we get into a situation, I mentioned mm -hmm. like airwaves before, there's a limited thing, there's a limited infrastructure yeah. for communication networks in mm -hmm. any country, yeah. and there's a exorbitant cost to, you wouldn't even be able to do it because you have to use public land, private land, things mm -hmm. like that to be able to create a new pipeline. So at some point, do we have a responsibility to set some sort of legislation up that does not let someone like Ma Bell buy up all of the companies that have communication networks mm -hmm. and then essentially control a monopoly on it um, because they're taking a limited resource and mm -hmm. controlling it whichever way they want. Yeah. So in the same way, do these individual ISPs who have a monopoly on a limited resource have the ability to do whatever they want with it? Yeah. So the, the issue of limited resource is definitely something that we should think about. But let's say the resource was not limited. Should you still be should you still be allowed to discriminate against different um, you know customers, for example? These customers is truly unlimited. Maybe there should be a government. The universe is limited. You're never going to find a resource that is not limited. Okay, fair plan. I would say the government should like you know they they regulate ISPs in a sense anyway. So maybe this is a case for the government to decide instead of us. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I guess uh, should ISPs allowed to say, okay, I like you, so I'm gonna transit your traffic for a lot less money than this other guy's traffic. Depends on why they're discriminating. It could be for uh, to promote certain services over some other services. 
Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's a tricky question, right? You get there's, into this situation where, oh, we're going to discriminate based on your race or bounce. based on <laughs> relationships. Yeah. Go ahead. There's too many potential downsides because then it turns into, well, if you're, you you have to be, you know, our preferential customer to get yeah. good speeds. So that's that's the main concern there, right? Yeah. Now, so let's think of, think about it from a technology perspective. Uh, how do we how can we detect if ISPs are neutral? So there is an ISP that says we're completely neutral. We don't discriminate. <laughs> yeah. Do you have somebody monitoring? So the thing is, you know, how can you develop evidence, you know, from outside the ISP? That okay, turns out uh, they are doing what they are claiming they are doing. Send various kinds of traffic through various routes that pass through their network. Yeah. So the the idea that was presented here is, you know, maybe we can send uh, different types of traffic through different types of paths or different paths, and see if there is any discrimination that we can detect in terms of performance. Right. For example, is the latency higher if you send traffic as Google versus Yahoo, right? So you could um, you could perform these various things, but you can also think of various ways in which the ISP might try to trick you into thinking that they are neutral. Can you think of ways? Let's say you work for the ISP and you know that there are these people who are performing these tests. If you can identify them, then you can just throttle all of their traffic instead of just the traffic you're discriminating. Right, from the ISP side, if you know that there are these people performing tests, and if there is a way for you to determine, okay, this is, a t this is test traffic, then you could you know, treat this test traffic differently than normal traffic. This is same complicated <laughs> <laughs> No, but uh, there is real money involved, and this is not complicated enough uh, when there are billions of dollars involved, right? So, when we're having all this discussion, then Google and Verizon actually work together to come up with these uh, policy recommendations for neut neutrality. They basically said that uh, they support openness, neutrality, transparency, uh, in, for network access to third party and consumers, but wireless is different. Why do, you, why do you think they said wireless is different? Why do they agree? Limited bandwidth. Or who are the parties in this uh, policy recommendation? I think that gives us a hint. <laughs> All right. But these are two big players. If they say, okay, here's our recommendation, people listen. So basically they're saying they're not neutral because they're, getting, they're putting the two cents in. Well, they're saying neutrality is great as long as it doesn't affect our lucrative cell phone business. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And here's the post that you had that I just mentioned yeah. by Reed Hastings, who is the CEO of Netflix. Why don't we just take a moment to read this? This was posted just uh, maybe last week. So what's going on here? So let me first uh, describe uh, some of the terms that they're using. Um, a lot of the ISPs these days, they institute a cap on the total data that you're allowed to transfer uh, per month. For example, let's say if I'm an AT&T customer, AT&T will say, you know, for example, I don't know exactly what the caps are, but they will say, you know, per month you're allowed to, you're allowed, you know, five gigabyte of transfer, as an example. So that's, that's a cap. And uh, so now, once you understand that, so can you tell, uh, tell us uh, in what way is this neutral? Um, they're exempting a service that they own from their caps. OK. So it turns out they're exempting one of the services that they own from, their, uh, from, from the cap. So is that a, is that a problem? <laughs> yeah. That's not a problem. Well, it's anti-competitive. It's anti-competitive. Okay. I mean, to a certain extent. So, so we we had someone here who supported capitalism and uh, 
private enterprise. Yeah, so I'd like to hear your thoughts. Well, I mean, uh, the, from their side, I mean, I see what Comcast, I see what the argument they would make would be, would be like, right. well, all this uh, traffic that's coming from, you know, Netflix, HBO, Hulu, whatever, like has to use up a lot more resources maybe than something that we generate from within. You know, I don't know. Maybe that's the argument they make. Oh, this is ours, so we're going to regulate Yeah, and also, yeah, why wouldn't we, you know, as, as capitalists, why wouldn't we make it cheaper, you know, cheaper to use our, we're providing you a service. I mean, like, why is this guy upset? You know, like, he, he's, he's, he's getting, he's he's getting more than he bargained for with these guys. <laughs> because he can't compete. Yeah, yeah, yeah. like I said, he's self-interested. I mean, like, yeah, he uses Netflix or whatever, but... Well, but the question is, why doesn't he can, start it, his can, own it own remain, <laughs> can it remain an effective capitalist system if there's no competition? Anymore? Look, if people don't like it, they'll stop using it, okay? You know, and then, and then they'll be forced to change their business model. So the question so, here is, uh, is there a good enough environment for many companies to compete and innovate? That That's the fundamental question here. And... Uh, you know, there, there's no resolution to these issues, by the way, because the legislations are being worked on. There are many court cases that are, uh, you know, making their way through the courts, and we don't have an answer to this. But something to think about: should the internet be neutral across all the services? All right. Finally, uh, the wireless spectrum. Now, let me just uh, spend a moment uh, just describing you know, how we allocate wireless spectrum these days and what the wireless spectrums are. So they are basically two broad classes of wireless spectrum. One class for commercial use, and another class for you know, non-profit and government use. For example, uh, the space of the spectrum used by our Wi-Fi access point and laptops, uh, these are not really allocated to a particular company. Anyone can use it. These are called ISM band. And there's a large part of spectrum that are allocated to various branches of the government for them to use, for example, military. Right? And there is another part of spectrum that is allocated to individual companies. Um, in the very early days, perhaps, you know, whoever went to the government and said, uh, we would like to use just this part of the space, uh, you'd probably just uh, give it to them. Just make a small registry and give it to them, right? Where things have gotten complex, and one of the ways that the government has started using for allocating this spectrum is by using something called auction. The government says, "Okay, you know, here is uh, the space of uh, the frequency that is now available for private companies to use, and let's see who can uh, pay the most." That's, that's an auction, right? So that is how the wireless spectrum allocation um, is being done um, more recently. So now here's a question. Should we be able to use any device or applications on wireless networks? Let's say a company gets part of the spectrum. Um, it's a 700 megahertz spectrum. So this was the spectrum occupied by analog TV when they were phased out. This part of the spectrum you know, was not used anymore, so we could use it for something else, for some other technologies, right? So should we, able to, should we be able to use any device or applications on, let's say, that particular spectrum? Because some company actually paid a lot of money to get part of that spectrum. So should we have the right to use any device or application on that network? I think this is the limited resource argument, is that if there is a limited resource like frequencies, mm -hmm. if you just let anybody go do whatever they want, whenever they want, you're mm -hmm. just going to have so much interference that it's not going to be useful for anybody. Right. So there's the limited uh, resource argument, which is you don't want anyone to use it, but should the company that you know paid the money to get that spectrum say, you're only allowed to use application XYZ, or you're only allowed to use device ABC, should that company be able to say that? Or should the company be able to say, if you want to use part of the spectrum, you better buy the device that we no, sell? Because it's a given. That happens because they were given uh, the authority by the government, right? But so they paid a lot of money to yeah, get that. Yeah, but we cannot have just say customers say, OK, if we don't like it, yeah. uh, we're not going to use it. Yeah. And it's not going to happen because another company cannot come and this, because this is like a, what they call it, the ISPs in general are government, well, government issues, I don't Mm -hmm. Well, you're not just using their spectrum, typically. You're also using their infrastructure. Right. Usually no, but I'm willing to pay. You talk to their right. network. Right. 
and then that's right. pass it through wires to somewhere so, else. So that's right. We're not just talking about spectrum when we're talking about network access. But let's say I'm willing to pay the normal rate. It's just that I would like to use this device that was uh, manufactured by somebody else. Should I be able to do that? I'm not saying I'm going to use this for free. I mean, that should not be allowed, right? Technologically speaking, it's not easy for them to stop you. Yeah, so technically, it's not easy for them to stop you. But uh, you know, legally, should you have the right to use a different device? Or legally, should the company be able to say, you're not allowed to use somebody else's device? That's the question. So anyways, hopefully this uh, gives you a sense for uh, various you know, policy issues that govern the internet. And depending on how some of these issues evolve, as we have conversation as a society, it's going to determine what kind of internet we will have in the future. So with that, I would like to just spend a couple minutes talking about the second exam. So the major topic that we covered after the exam is routing. Uh, in routing, we first spent a lot of time talking about distance vector routing and link state routing. And I would like you to be able to work out concrete examples of routing for the test. For example, it's not adequate that uh, you can just define what is distance vector routing or define link state routing. No. If presented with an example with a real network with nodes in you know, A, B, C, D, E, F with lines representing the links, you should be able to work out you know, how the routing protocol should work. Okay? You get a sense for this from last exam too, right? It's not adequate that you can just define things. All right? I want you to know about loops and count to infinity. And uh, some of the good things and bad things of these two classes of routing protocols. All right, so those are the main topics. Then we started talking about inter-autonomous system routing, specifically our discussions of uh, BGP. Um, during that discussion, we spent a lot of time saying this is a policy-based routing, right, a path vector policy-based routing. There are various peering policies, various relationships that different autonomous systems might have with each other. For example, you should be able to work out examples where, uh, you know, looking at a graph, uh, you should be able to say, well, for uh, this particular network, it doesn't make sense to have, to allow this kind of traffic to transit. You know, given these relationships in a graph, it doesn't make sense for uh, this network to transit this kind of traffic to this other ISP. You should be able to work that out. We also talked about some unstable configurations and some security issues in BGP. I want you to be uh, well versed in those. IP addressing, uh, the basic ideas behind IP addressing, NATs, and forwarding. You don't, you don't need to know a great level of detail here, just, uh, but you need to have a good understanding of it. But uh, definitely be able to work out concrete examples for these two topics. BGP and policies, and uh, just the standard routing algorithms. Okay, so that's that's the routing. Then we spent some time talking about link and physical layer. You need to know the basics of CSMA. You should be able to do some math to determine okay what's the length of the cable and things like that. Right, it's pretty easy. And Ethernet switching and spanning trees. Uh, for physical layer. I don't want you to spend a lot of time uh, learning the details of various modulation schemes and so forth, but I want you to have a basic understanding of it. But in terms of you know, the details that you might want to know, I would focus on CSMA. And when going to wireless networks, I want you to understand hidden and exposed terminals, RTS, CTS, and the idea behind CTMA. For example, you should have a clear understanding for what hidden and exposed terminals are, and how RTS, CTS, you know, address some of the problems, and maybe they don't address all the problems. I want you to have a very concrete understanding of these concepts. I want you to know how we do multi-hop routing in wireless, and how we describe the quality of a link. We spend some time talking about this metric called ETX. What it is, why do we need it, how do we use it, I want you to know that in concrete details. The ETX and wireless routing. Our TA did a fantastic presentation on Ripple, RPL. Um, I want you to have a basic idea for what it is and how it is related to, for example, ETX and wireless routing, for example. I, I don't expect you to know the details of the Ripple protocol. 
but you should know what it is and how it's related to the rest of it, right? And finally, we spent, I think, about two lectures talking about uh, security. I want you to know the basics of cryptography. For example, we talked about symmetric key encryption and public-private key encryption, right? And based on those two basic techniques, we also developed ways to, uh, for example, certify that a message actually originated, uh, you know, was originated by a person or an entity, right? The digital signatures, I want you to understand that idea and how HTTPS works. We actually went through that example. All right, so that's the summary of all the topics that are covered in exam two. Uh, we really, we really ran out of time here, so I encourage you to post questions on Piazza. If you have any questions about, uh, okay, how much details do we know about in a certain topics or not, or even if you want to have some discussion about some of the topics that are not clear to you. Uh, we can definitely go to TA's office hours. You can come to my office hour and also post questions on Piazza if that is uh, more convenient for you. And can you give us an example like you did last time? Yeah, I, I will post uh, some example, maybe today, tomorrow, or something like that, after I post uh, the last homework. Okay, any, any other high-level questions? Because we're going to have the detailed, uh, I think, discussions either during office hours or in Piazza. Any questions? So you know you um, you know you're allowed to bring a page of notes, and it can be printed, as we said last time. Yes, go ahead. Okay, um, I already told you at least the topics that you should have concrete understanding of, and if that involves some memorization, I would definitely just uh, write it down. Uh, because I don't want you to spend time memorizing things. All right? So that's it for now, and we'll have more conversations.